Hey there, Floss Tube. This is Kathy, the hands on designer, and I'm wearing my apron today, so you know what that means. It's a Floss Tube tutorial, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit more, as promised, about this particular piece. If you remember, this is the chart that came out, I believe, let's see, it was in July. Um, if pumpkins could fly, if pumpkins could fly up in the sky, I'd ride with you and shout out, boo! Okay, this, um, actually, I'm not here to talk any more about the frame piece today, this make do finish. Actually, you can read more about this in a blog post that I did oh, a little over a year ago um, where I kind of walked you through the steps, how I made, did a make do finish with this particular frame. So I'm going to put this down. I just wanted you to know that Frankie here comes in the same chart. And as I said in um, uh, my previ a previous video, this was the piece that I designed originally for Garen Citry for their Bag of the Month Club, but now it's released for all to enjoy. And I've seen quite a few of you out there with your fall stitching working on it. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about the finishing, hence today's tutorial or talk, I guess, is pretty informal, um, about how I got that shape for the Frankenstein ornament. Um, now, I did not do a template this time, probably going to regret that. Um, so I thought, well, this is the perfect opportunity to talk to you about, you know, just exactly how I get that particular shape. Now, um, I started doing templates for a lot of my shaped finishes. So if you got, if you are stitching some of my ornaments like early on and they have shaped finishes, um, I'd say actually probably pre 12 days of Christmas ornaments. I didn't do templates for those because at that point, those kind of weren't really a, a thing to do, but now it is definitely the thing to do. Um, but as I explained kind of when I talked about the make do finish, I was running a little late and yeah, I didn't, I didn't make a template. So here we are. We're going to talk about how I make my shapes for these types of ornaments, specifically um, for this particular ornament from the If Pumpkins Could Fly, which is in your shops now. Um, so make sure you check it out. But I want to just kind of do a little background talk about, you know, what kind of supplies you want to gather and have on hand when you're going to do some ornaments. I know a lot of you out there, this is the season, you've been stitching your ornaments. Um, I see people that they're like one ornament a month and then they're going to have 12 new ornaments for their tree or as gifts or something like that. And I think that's a fantastic idea. So, um, so anyway, whew. All right, take a breath, Kathy. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that I keep on hand um, for when I go to do my, my ornament finishing. So first of all, um, I usually have a pretty good supply of mat board. And this particular is acid-free um, mat board. I also have um, cardboard. I have the type that I put in mailers that type. These also happen to come from my printer when they send me my um, my charts. Usually they're bundled together and then they've got this piece of cardboard behind them. Well, we keep that cardboard. That's like gold. Um, I also have a variety of pieces of, um, this is just a standard foam core, standard thickness, like you get the large sheets from your favorite craft store. Um, so again, just more mat board, more cardboard and a uh, foam core. So other things that it's nice to have on hand if you can get them. Um, of course, I always keep ribbons. I keep, um, I don't know, I keep all sorts of ribbons. <laughs> I have a little problem. Ribbons, and there's a few things here that like you're gonna go, I bet she has a ton of, and you know what, you would be right. <laughs> so ribbon. Now I've been a gingham girl for a very long time and I like your good black and white and red and white and uh, teal and white, all kinds of fun stuff. But when I find a color, this is kind of like a, I'm gonna call this a pumpkin spice gingham. This is um, kind of a it's, a, it's not an orange in your face orange, it's more of a burnt orange and cream. Um, and it comes out, it's a seasonal ribbon. So it's in a lot of your hobby stores right now. Now is the time to get it. Get it when it's on sale, stock up, keep it, because this is not, this particular one is not out all year round. Um, so anyway, so I keep nice ribbon on hand. As you'll notice, I used it as the hanger. And you don't have to use ribbon as a hanger. You can use cording, you can use burlap, you can use, uh, there's all kinds of things. You, not burlap, like the, but twine, burlap-y twine. Um, jute, I guess is what I meant, sorry. Uh, of course, I also have 
I added a little touch of the um, baker's twine. I have baker's twine in probably, I don't know, yeah, there should be probably a 12 step program for baker's twine, ribbon, and all things doodaddy that I add to my pieces. And these are things that, I mean, it's, it's easy to find. I get a lot of colors, again, from my big box craft stores. I also get a lot from, you know, Etsy sites, things like that. Just Google, um, or search for Baker's Twine. And you'll get, of course, the, the traditional black and white, but there's so many colors because it's very popular in scrapbooking. And those are actually a lot of the sites that I kind of troll for like uh, fun gadgets, not gadgets, but doodads to add to my uh, finishing. Of course, there's the ever-present Rick Rack. Now this is not the color that I used in this one. This was a hand-dyed trim by Lady Dot called Jack. Um, and I'm out of it, so I gotta get some more. Um, but I just grabbed this just to kind of show you. Cause especially fun colors, like this olivey green, you don't see that everywhere. Um, and, and and of course, I just love my hand-dyed trims from Lady Dot. And actually she has a sim color very similar to this called Grace Green. Tons of colors, check out. She's available in shops. And also she has an Etsy site. So I love using, probably I use Rick Rack. I do use Chenille and I've done palms. Um, probably my go-to is either Rick Rack or honestly, I most of the time I do like a, a, a cording, you know, with, I make my own with um, DMC that coordinates. So um, that's easy enough. And then of course, I always like to have some fun uh, things on hand like, you know, you'll notice I use that little green palm, uh, wool felt palm, and I happen to have kind of a, a fun collection that I go to every once in a while. I am out of green, it looks like. Ooh, better be getting some more. Benzie Design is where I get a lot of my um, supplies like that, and it's a fun website. You should check it out. Um, so those are some things that just the, the extra fun bits. Um, also have your, uh, your, your uh, batting, and let's see what else of course some fun fabric i'm going to use this today but this is the fabric that i used on the back this um was from a collection that i got from the simple stitches fabric ladies fabric shop um they're the ones that do those uh fabric collections for my um chalk talk series and we've got a couple more fun projects coming up together so even if you're not necessarily going to make the project that they're using that for it's they're like awesome at putting collections together so it's kind of fun to have those especially like if you're in a kick of like christmas finishing or halloween finishing in this case it's really nice and handy to have those fabric collections on hand um what else i've got double-sided acid free tape um your shop should be able to get this for you i do have it in my website um as well under the Oh, there's a section for all those extra little bits and bobs. <laughs> That's where it is. Sorry. Um, I also have my uh, uh, paper scissors and my sticky scissors and, of course, my fabric scissors. And they survived Mr. HOD using them. Inside joke if you saw that episode. Lacing thread, which is upholstery thread. Um, uh, exacto. And then I also, okay, besides... <laughs> ribbon and um and uh, rick rack and baker's twine i also kind of have a little obsession with pins um so if i find you know you can get white pins yellow pins black pins you know the, the glass head pins or plastic head pins i mean you can get those basic colors all the time but when i see like different colors that are unusual that may be seasonal i grab them and i hoard my pin collection almost as much as i don't know anything else but th years ago i bought this um fun little tin of course you know the tin was kind of cute too because i do love my dots um but these had um orange like kind of a, a, a i don't know a rusty orange um pin head and you don't see orange pins that much so I keep, I have a, an entire collection of just fun, different color um, headed pins. And, and of course you could paint them if you needed to. Um, but you know, if you got a collection, then it's just easy to go raid your collection every once in a while. Um, so, all right, so let's talk about, um, let's see, did I cover everything? Those are just some different supplies to have on hand. And then um, before I turn the camera down again, I do wanna talk a little bit about, um, 
different things for getting those curved edges. So you can freehand it, which a lot of times I do, um, but sometimes, I mean, I use very specific industry grade tools sometimes to get my curved corners. Like these are specially made. Okay, joke here, sorry. <laughs> um, sometimes I use, I have a round, something, I mean, I literally look around my area to see like what could be round and like that might fit or hey, sometimes it's the, it's the tape. Um, I've even been known to use, like if I just want to round a little corner, I use a tape dispenser. Um, I do also have this fun gadget. It's a ruler. It's kind of more in the quilt world of things, um, but it's got, it's a ruler, but then it bends. <laughs> it does all kinds of fun stuff. Um, sorry, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so this is a good gadget to have on time on hand sometimes too. Um, and I do use it quite a bit when I just, you know, can't quite find the right curve and I, and my, my drawing skills that day are just not quite where I want them to be. Um, so anyway, so those are some fun things to have on hand. And, um, these, I know you can pick up at quilt shops. Um, I believe I probably got mine online. Um, it's got metric on one side and, and um, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, I can't remember the name of it. I picked it up so many years ago. Um, but anyway, so these are kind of good gadgets to have on hand um, for your finishing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, how I measure. Now for this particular one, I did use a lot. I, this is a question I get a lot in classes. Um, what uh, like what do I use for the front and the back? Because those are two separate pieces. So now for this particular one, I'm going to speak mostly for this one. Um, is actually the I can tell by the thickness it's a foam core front, and then the back is mat board. I will say probably 85% of the time I use a mat board front and a cardboard back just because I don't want it to be too thick. For but for some reason I just wanted this ornament because he was just going to be by himself it wasn't like a whole set or series or something like that. Um, I wanted him to have a little more presence. So I made him a little thicker and that's why I did the foam core front and then the mat board back. And um, now I can tell also just another little um, tip is um, this is on, I believe, platinum linen. But if you look real closely, he kind of has a dark cast behind him. I did actually put a piece of cotton now on, and we'll talk about this in a minute when I turn the camera down. Um, I do put usually two layers of batting on the front. Sometimes I put batting on the back, sometimes I don't. This one I know has one layer because um, I don't want as much padding on the back as I do on the front. Um, but especially when I'm stretching something that, lacing something that is like a lot of my chalk pieces or something on black, I put a little piece of cotton, black cotton behind it just so that, you know, the, the cause, because your batting is you know, cream or white, you can get dark batting, but I don't always have it on hand, but I usually always have some kind of black cotton on hand. Um, and, and I cut a piece just so that the white batting doesn't shine through um, your holes, whether it be it linen, be it Ada. That also sometimes works if you're working on lighter colors. Now this is a platinum, so kind of a lighter color, but not say antique white or anything like that. Um, but the colors that I stitched with are fairly light colors. So, cause I wanted it more, well, it was the look I was going for with the design and, and the color palette. Um, but I felt like when I laid this over top of the batting, it just really washed this out a lot. So I did actually audition putting a piece of fabric, a piece of cotton fabric behind the stitching that matched the platinum. And then I also, and I just, again, I just sort of felt like it just washed it. Um, so I put some, one that was just slightly darker. I have a pretty good fabric collection, as you can imagine, on hand. And, um, and so I just put, it's probably like, um, it's probably about that color of gray right there, which seems odd, but I felt like it didn't dull it too much, but yet it, it enabled the colors, especially like the white to pop a little bit more. So those are just some little tips and tricks. Um, sometimes I do put white 
behind say if i had stitched this on antique white because you can get batting in white white um, but most of the time what i have on hand is this sort of ecru color plus this does tend to always have flex and do check your piece because your piece of batting because one side has less flex let's say that slowly less fleck it's less fleckier than the other side so this would be your flecky side this would be your non-flecky side um so make sure that you kind of check on those things because those flecks will show through your lighter colors of linen so again you can just put a little piece of uh, white fabric beneath your stitching before you lace it and it just kind of brightens everything a little bit so anyway I'm going to stop there and I'm going to actually turn the camera down and I'm just going to kind of show you how um, I get going on the shaping for something like a, a shaped ornament like that. Because really, um, yeah, this could totally have been done just on a, um, a, on a rectangle piece, but sometimes just that little extra added curve kind of takes it up a notch in the finishing department, gives it a real custom look. Um, so uh, hold on, I'm going to turn the camera down. Okay, so we are back and I am ready to help you figure out how to cut your uh, piece to get that kind of that curved, what I'm calling kind of a more custom look to your, uh, to your ornaments. Now, uh, what I do start with is a rectangle. And I mean, obviously this could be finished as a rectangle, um, but I just think it kind of gives it just a little more appeal to make it that curved finish. So I actually do start with a rectangular shape. Now that one I've already cut, we'll get to that in a minute. But the first thing I have to do is figure out how big to cut that piece of this piece of cardboard. Um, so what I typically do is I leave about, my, my go-to is uh, 3 8 to a half inch showing all around the stitched image. That's just pretty much what I do most of the time. I will say, uh, probably about 90% of the time, I go more to the 3 8 showing. I just like a little less linen. On this one, I actually went even a little closer than that. Probably, oh yeah, this is more about a quarter inch at, from, at the widest spot. Mostly because with this one, you know, I don't have a real defined edge. There's a lot of white space or negative space here. Um, so you kind of have to look at the ornament you're finishing and determine how much you actually really want showing. And the beauty of it is, is I tend to cut larger than I think I might. Like I'm probably started this one at a half inch away on all sides. And then I just kind of cut it down because I could do that. Um, anyway, so here's now how we're going to measure the piece, the, rec the size rectangle that we're going to um, start with. I'm going to go at first with that three eighths, like I said, I, I do most of the time. So I'm going to look on my ruler with its little marks and here's one, two, three eighths, one, two, three eighths, which in this case does equal three quarters of an inch. So I'm gonna lay that three quarters of an inch mark down on the edge, the very farthest tip of my stitching. And then I'll come over here and okay, so it's really ending right between four and five eighths and four and three quarters. All right, so for purposes of what I'm gonna choose to cut it, I'm probably gonna err on the larger because I can always cut it back. So I'm gonna cut that first measurement four and three quarters. And all right, if you're like me, make sure you write it down on something. <laughs> and then, I mean, you can always go back and measure it, but you know. Um, and then you definitely, if you're kind of new at this, remember what they say, measure twice, cut at least once, I don't know. So I'm gonna get to the three quarters point here and I'm gonna go to the topmost point of the, um, of the stitching and I'm gonna go to the bottom, which in this case is uh, three and three eighths. All right, so that's what size I wanna make my base piece of foam core. So right now we're cutting out what's gonna be the front of the piece. So here's my foam core and it, I just, I keep scraps. If they're a decent size scrap, I keep them because that definitely comes in handy for, you know, it's an ornament size. Like much like we all keep our scraps of linen, I keep my scraps of foam core. Now it might not always have a straight edge. So I definitely want to make sure that I use my mat, my ruler, my X-Acto, and I make sure I've got at least um, two edges squared, which I already did for this piece before we started. So in this case, I think this is my, I don't know if this is my 
All right, so I'm lined up here and I'm lined up there and I'm gonna use my ruler. I'm gonna cut my, because this is the, the, the wider, I'm gonna cut my three and three eighths. Let's see, hold on, I'll just double check, make sure I did that. Yep, I'm good. So um, I'm gonna cut, come over here, one, two, three, and line up on the lines of my mat, three and three eighths. Check on this side, line everything up. Yep, I'm good, check this side, okay. So what I've done is I've used this ruler and I used the also the straight edge of the ruler and lined it up on the um, 3 8 line on the mat below. And I'm gonna take my X-Acto and I'm holding down, you know, pretty tight with this hand on here. And then you wanna just, as I've talked about in other videos, you wanna pull towards yourself and don't try and go through it all in one swipe. The first time I like to go through and score it. Okay, I just went through a little bit and then I'll go through again. And third time should be the charm. There we go. All right, sorry that moved. I've got my little ro rotating mat here because I came upstairs because they're busy packing kits and everything downstairs in the studio. So there's my three and three eighths. I think, I want to say, I think I might have actually already cut this side, the four and three quarters. Double, double check. I did, so that generally is the shape that we start with. Now you can see it's a little bit wider than this, um, but for purposes of what we're doing, because I actually, okay, so here's, oh, I'll stop right there. This is a good example of, I held that up and I went, mm, that's a little too much white space showing. So I trimmed it down. Obviously I had the, the piece just, you know, hanging free and I held this up behind it into a window or a light or source or something. And I went, eh, I didn't like the way it looked. This is where you kind of make tiny judgment calls. You want it to be a little narrower. I want it, see here, really, um, I'm probably about a quarter inch away there. And well, maybe a little bit more than a quarter inch there. But again, mostly it was because I had so much negative space around. Um, so this is when you would take that opportunity to make it a little narrower. Um, now I did cut this one down. I was making a couple demos here so we could have that. So yeah, I actually cut that one to fit and that measurement is, uh, this is about four and a half. So I, I cut a good quarter inch off, which makes sense. And you're probably thinking, well, then why did she do this? Well, this is where you can start. All right, and then just make those little adjustments as you go. Um, I think this would also look perfectly acceptable with slightly more around it. It was just my own personal aesthetic of how much I wanted to show. Um, then I always make the board the, the same distance, uh, the three eighths here and the three eighths there. I typically don't cut that any smaller just because I am going to be freehanding or cutting a little bit off. And then, you know, and then if I find that it's too tall, then I can always take a little swipe off the bottom here. So for this one, okay, easy thing would be to do, I could now take my little bendy ruler and I could go along. If you say if you have another ornament or at home or a shape that you like, you could take your little bendable ruler here and you could bend it to the size that you like or to, to match. And then you would just literally just lay that on and, and hold that in place. Then I would just trace it just like that, all right? And you can see how I got a nice little curved line right there. Now, at this point, I actually, yeah, you know, I kind of really, I, I really like that. And if I hold that up, I did a good job of, of uh, mirroring this. Now, you're gonna say, yeah, but you're going from an ornament that's already done. True. So a lot of times what I do is I'll take my little board like this, and we're just gonna have to pretend this isn't finished. So I lay my stitching down and I do trim it so that I don't have all the linen there. And I kind of lay, kind of lay the bottom of this to where the bottom of this is. And then I come over here and I start seeing where the design sort of starts arcing in a little bit like that. So it really starts arcing in about his hand. And of course you wanna arc in at the same spot down here. So I take my, my just my pencil and I just kind of make a little mark 
right there on the mat board. All right, then set that aside for right now. Then I'm going to carry that line across because we want it the same on both sides. And I'm just gonna start. So now I have a, lot, a little mark here and a little mark there. All right, then we're back with the we're back with the, the, the sample piece, the cut piece. And then I wanna see where, okay, we started arcing here. Now I wanna see where that curve sort of stops and we get that flat side across the top. And you'll notice I'm only doing one side and then we're mirroring it over here. So right about this line right here, and I'm kind of eyeballing it, um, is where that arc stops. So here to here. Hopefully you can see that. Now I'm going to measure that with my ruler, which is an inch and an eighth, one and one eighth inches. So I'm gonna come over to this side and mark my one and one eighth inches. So now I've got um, a mark here, a mark here, a mark here, a mark there. And they're pretty much, well, they are in the same spot. So a lot of times um, I will actually just hand draw something. All right, and so you can just take a pencil, obviously, not a nice handy, got a nice handy eraser, and you can just do a gentle arc, okay? Some people are really good, they just go zoop. I tend to like to, as I sketch, I'm, I'm, I'm call it a, a feather sketcher. Um, I, I tend to feather my lines, and then I go back and I make them a little bit stronger. All right, so you can just see, I hopefully you can see that. Can you see that? Yep, you can see my line, all right? And um, I do a couple different things. If I'm feeling really careful that day, I'll take this and I'll just zoop right along that line like that, or I will use my um, paper scissors, which are also good for um, your foam core. And what I wanna do, and I'm gonna show you this in a minute, because I really want both sides to be the same. And what I have found is that you can draw this way, and if I come over here and draw that way, it's never gonna be the same arc at all. So what I really wanna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut along my line. And yes, it makes the edges of your, um, uh, your foam core a little crunchy. That's okay, that doesn't really matter in this. And I. You can see I just took my time and I cut along that line. And the reason why I do this and I wanna try and get it in one piece is because guess what? Now you have a little pattern. So it does, you know, because you're using those scissors there, it does kind of misshape this a little bit. So I'm kind of moving this so it's, we're pretty much back in shape. And then I take this and I lay it right on top of my other corner and I use that as a guide. And again, I kind of just feather my stitch a little bit, or feather my, oh, feather my stitch. Stitching on the brain, feather my, my stroke with the pencil a little bit. And yeah, I like that. So it's a little wobbly, but it's enough for a, uh, a guide for my scissors. And I am ready to go ahead and just cut that. And again, I'm cutting along the lines. And so there you see. So now I have a nice curved dome to my foam core, all right? And granted, I would, uh, now at this point, what I would do is, is I would take my stitching and I would hold it up to the light again with this kind of nested behind it so that I can see, do I like this curve? And actually I think I've done my job pretty well because if I hold that up behind the actual finished ornament, I'm, I'm almost dead on with the, the curve that I did originally do. Um, so there you go. That's a nice easy way to get two corners that have the same curve to it. So you can see that was there and I trimmed it off and I put it over here and I just use that as a template to get that side. Now, another thing you're gonna notice is that, um, Lorna just walked in, so you wanna say hi? Hi. <laughs> they can hear you, they can't see you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so the other thing you're gonna notice is that I'm actually cutting, especially this is important when we're doing shaped pieces, 
I'm cutting the piece that's going to be behind the stitching, all right? I am not cutting, I'm, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this now as my template. This becomes the template for the backing. Um, and so what I wanna do is I'm not gonna go through all those steps again to get the, the back. I'm actually going to use this. I'll get my cardboard. And I know I used mat board on this one, but I'm just gonna do cardboard. And I'm going to lay my cardboard on this. I'll use my straight edges where I can, kind of as a little, now I guess a cheat, we can call it that. But I'm gonna lay that, and then I'm going to trace. See, now I don't have to cut that side and I don't have to cut that side. And there's my backing. Um, it is especially important when you're working with curved edges or specialty shapes that you only cut one side. Well, be it the back or be it the front. I like to do the front because you're actually you know, looking to make it fit the front, the stitching portion. So you wanna cut this and then use this as a guide because little um, little idiosyncrasies can happen with your, with your curves, um, that type of thing. So what we wanna do is when you cut this out and especially on those curve lines is we wanna make sure that these two fit together. We don't wanna have one kind of little, uh, you know, popped up above uh, the, the back, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna cut this quickly, show you what I mean, because I feel like I'm not making quite much sense. Um, sometimes these hands-on things, this is a class definitely that I need to either demonstrate or I need to be in front of you and you need to really be hands-on. This is the type of thing that I do teach in class. So I'm not probably going as in depth as I would say in a class, but this gives you a good overall um, idea of what I'm talking about. So I cut along that line and I'm, I'm lining them up, making sure that they have a good fit. I don't want the back piece, if you can see there, I can see a little bit of the back piece of the, the cardboard showing there. Uh, but actually along the top, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. So I'm going to take a little, just a little uh, bit of my pencil kind of draw right there. So I see where I need to trim a little bit. Yep, just do a little trim. Okay, let's line them up again. Oh yeah, much better. And even you can feel when you're when you're holding it, you know, you can put your put your fingers on the edge like that and you can feel that they're they're flush. Okay, now as you move things around your work surface and stuff like that, you know, things could get flipped over and you could be like, ah, you know, especially if a curve, I don't want to go this way because chances are the way you cut, maybe we don't have a good fit. So what I'd like to do is on the inside, I like to put a little star there and a little star here. And if I'm doing multiples, um, like when I was doing the Fright This Way series, when I was finishing all those, and I had nine, actually no, because of two colorways, I had um, 18 different ornaments to finish. I just put one and one. So star one, star one, star two, star two. That way, like I said, if these get jumbled up or, or whatever, um, uh, then you know that those are the two that go together. So, so that's kind of how you um, you can just sort of freehand it, and that gives you a little idea of how you can get a very custom look. And again, if you want to use just, if you don't feel comfortable freehanding it like I did, or gauging where the arc of your ornament begins and ends, you know, try using rounded um, pieces. Uh, so you then you could just kind of lay that there, lay that on your corner, if that's kind of the, the, if that fits the arc of your piece, and then, you know, you, you've got a good um, edge there. And you can also do it on the other side. And you don't have to do that little flip reverse pattern kind of thing because you're using the same object as your guide. All right, so there I did it. Now I've also, you'd be amazed, uh, you know, like this is a slightly larger circle. So that might be better for your particular piece. You have to sort of look at the piece you're doing um, and just determine what kind of a, I, you know, what kind of a curve you needed. I needed a longer, slower curve, not just a particular, you know, just a, an instant curve. Um, 
know that I only bring this up because there have been many times when I've used a tight little curve for smaller spaces, just the tighter curve of a, of a tape measure. You know, just kind of lean it up there and go like that. Whoop, and I got my nice little corner. Um, and what else? I, and again, you know, kind of go back to this fun little tool. I might see a shape that um, I have, but it's, it's a big container and it's awkward. So then I bend this, you know, around that. And then I've got my nice, you know, I've got my nice curve like that. So uh, you could freehand it, you could use shapes. Uh, the trick really is gonna be is, you know, if you, especially if you're freehanding it, getting those beginning points and ending points, cutting one, flipping it over, using that as your guide um, for your next. So we're gonna talk a little bit now about, um, obviously I'm not gonna show you how I stitch this because it's, or I laced this because it's already done, but I'm gonna demonstrate a little bit um, about how to get going on your, um, with, with your fabric backing like that. So sorry, I, I probably sound like I'm fudging or fumbling along, but I really didn't practice this. I've just been kind of, this is sort of what I do and I just do it and I don't think about it. So then sometimes you have to put it into words and it sounds a little funny. <laughs> so I'm gonna grab some cotton fabric here and I'm gonna use my foam core. So I like to put a piece of double-sided acid-free tape. Where's my end? Yeah, it would be nice. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna cut a little piece of this. Come on. I'm gonna just cut a little piece of that and I'm gonna put it in the middle, not the star side, because the star side, remember, is gonna be inside. And that way we know it all matches up. So I'm gonna peel that tape back and then I've got some batting here. And again, on my front, remember I said, I like to layer two um, pieces of, of batting just to give it a nice, cushion. So I actually have this right on top of the two layers already. And then I'm going to take my rotary cutter and I'm going to cut around it just to get it out of the big piece. All right, move that to the side. Then I can either use the rotary cutter to cut some of it away like that, or I can use my paper scissors. And when I cut, I don't cut like, I like to leave what's called a scant bit showing um, against the edge or uh, out, that sticks out again uh, from the edge of the, um, of the, of the, the, the shaped piece. So if you look at that, you can kind of see ever so little bit of batting um, sticking out. That's a scant bit. And there's a reason why I do that, and it will come in handy, and I'm going to tell you about it as we get going. Um, so now I've got, pretend like this is gonna be the front of my, my ornament. I cut it, and I like the shape. It fits my stitching. I've got two layers of batting on there. There is a piece, like I said, of the double-sided acid-free tape. I did not put a piece in between. These will kind of adhere to each other, but this is as I'm moving my stitching around, I don't want the batting to move too, so this sort of keeps the batting in place. All right, so now, if this was the linen, I would be trimming my linen, but it's not. So I'm gonna get a piece of my little cotton here. And you can see how, you know, how very scientific I am with a lot of this. <laughs> um, and I would, if I had my iron here, I would, um, I would probably iron this piece, but I'm going to leave, oh, you know, about three quarters inch of fabric. And I do like to curve the fabric. Um, this, and so I'm just gonna go like this with my, you can do it with your scissors, or you can just kind of eyeball it with your rotary cutter. I don't want that corner because it's gonna be a lot of extra fabric, um, putting a bulk back there that you just don't really want. Okay, you can see I went through with my um, rotary cutter and I just cut right around. You see that? And that's probably about, in some spots I look like an inch, other spots about three quarters of an inch, um, which is good. I might trim this down just a little bit. You don't want too much fabric, but you definitely need enough. All right, so now I'm gonna grab my, um, my, my upholstery thread 
and I use one or two ply, really just kind of depending on several things, like how thick the fabric is, how thick the linen is. Um, if it's a thicker, sometimes I do um, two strands or sometimes I do one. Uh, I, in this case, I am gonna do two. So I made a real nice long piece, put it through my sharp needle. You do not wanna do this with our tapestry needle. We need to have that sharpness to go through the fabric. Tapestry needle and you'll be sending me hate mail because it's no fun to put a dull tip tapestry needle through cotton. And if I sound funny, it's because I have a needle in my mouth. Okay, so I made a knot. All right, now um, on my website, I do have a couple of to static tutorials. Not all my tutorials are video, um, but I have tutorials on how I uh, flat finish um, shaped. That would be the 12 days um, tutorial for the 12 days of Christmas. And then I have a couple other just regular old flat finish tutorials as if it was a square. So I'm not going to walk through all of this. I don't necessarily want to continually repeat my instructions. So there will be times when I'll say, please refer to the um, the flat finish, the, the shaped flat finish tutorial for 12 days. Yes, it's the tutorial for 12 days, but the knowledge of how to lace the back of the ornament works for everything, okay? So sometimes I might refer you to another tutorial. Plus, there are times I feel like, you know, in class or video or tutorials, there are always little things that you can pick up. So sometimes, you know, it's worth, you know, you think, well, this may not apply. Well, yeah, it actually does. It's the same basic finishing. Um, so one thing before we do get going is I want to make sure that the batting is face side down. All right, and you should be seeing your star. Now, if this was my stitching, I'd want to hold it up to the light, make sure I was nice and centered. Um, I kind of fold my edge over at times to make sure, yep, yep, ooh, and then make any little adjustments to make sure my stitching is centered. Um, so I like to lace when I'm doing a curved edge. I like to go crossways first where I can just do um, lacing back and forth up to the flat edge. Then, then we'll work our way across the top and then start incorporating the short side. Okay. I don't know why it's just, it's just my habit. It's how I end up, how I've done it for years. So let's pretend that my stitching is all centered. I'm going to fold this side over and this side over. I am a righty. So this is how a righty would do it. If you're a lefty, do it the opposite way. <laughs> um, okay, so you can see I folded my edges over and I've got my nice sharp needle loaded up. I did two ply here and I've got a knot in the end and I'm going to scoop a little bit of fabric over there, meaning when I say scoop, I mean I go in and out of the fabric perpendicular, sorry, parallel to the edge of my fabric. And I'm going to, because this is the point that'll have the most stress on it, I'm gonna go through again. All right, and then you can see with each with each time I go through with my needle, I'm actually pulling. And this involves, okay, both hands, and sometimes you're gonna feel like you need a third or a fourth hand. Uh, practice, it feels awkward at first, I'm not gonna lie. It can feel very awkward at first, but definitely just practice. And, um, and the, the good thing about this is if you feel like it's not tight enough, you can always go back and pull on your lacing and make it tighter. So now you can see what I've done. I've done this so many times, I just did it without explaining. I've gone and parked my needle through the other side because I'm lacing back and forth, almost like in a ladder sti stitch um, uh, fashion. So I, again, I'm scooping my needle through the fabric or the linen, um, but in this case, the, the fabric. Um, it's, so it goes in and out of the fabric, parallel to the edge of the fabric. And I'm gonna pull again and and then I'm gonna pull. You can see all of a sudden that just started really sucking all that fabric in. And then I come back to this side. And by scooping, you're not creating those divots through to the front that kind of give you pulls on your, um, on your stitching, all right? And I'm just gonna work my, what I do when I'm, I'm working on a shaped finish like this, I'm just gonna keep lacing until I get to the point where we start to 
curve, curve in, in this case. So I think I've got this stitch. Yep, you can kind of see I'm starting to curve in a little bit. I'm going to come over here, do one more bit of lacing, and then I'm actually going to create an anchor knot right there. So that way I can stop, because I'm pull, I'm holding down on this, um, on this, so my, my lacing stay nice and taut. All right, so you can see what we look like at this point. You can see what my lacing looks like. So now I'm ready to go, and I'm gonna do kind of a basting stitch around the top to gather, to cinch all that in. See, that's what we look like on that side too. So what's nice though is now I'm not having to hold on to this to make sure these stitches stay nice and tight because I placed that anchor knot right there. And this is also why I start with a fairly long thread because I don't want to have to stop and start all the time. It can get kind of messy at times in the beginning, but you're going to quickly suck up a lot of that thread, that length of thread. So here's what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually do kind of what I call basting stitches. Fold the uh, your, your linen or fabric over and I just take a couple nice basting stitches and I'm just going to do that across the whole top. Now, you can read the instructions on any of the other flat finishing tutorials, and I do this the same way. So this kind of knowledge applies to a lot of other things. All right. And you'll notice I'm not necessarily pulling real tight like I did the first um, when I was lacing back and forth. I'm going to wait and do that at the end because I'm working my way all across to the other side. All right, so I'm, I've worked my way across. Now I'm gonna give it a nice little pull. This is also why it helps to have a double thread because then your thread won't, uh, even though it's a nice strong thread, it's an upholstery weight thread, it can break. I mean, I, I pull my stuff pretty tight. So you can see I've pulled that nice and tight. Look on the front, ooh, I'm already getting kind of a nice shape there. And again, if you're able to hold on to it, if you want to put another what I call an anchor knot in, oh, that one didn't work. I'm gonna have to do it again. And again, this just frees your hand up so you can kind of help manipulate and work the fabric or the linen. Okay, so I was able to get my, my anchor knot in that time. Look how nice that looks. Now, sometimes you might you might be getting, because we're using cotton and it's a little more pliable, we're already getting a nice shape, but you might get little puckers and little dents and divots up here. That's okay, we're gonna take care of that with the next step. So now I'm actually going to start lacing the bottom to the top. And so you can sort of see already, and this would happen with your linen or Ada as well, that because I pulled so tight here, it kind of pulled the um the the seam in or the selvage in a little down at the bottom here that's perfect that's what you want to happen because we're gonna fold this up and when I fold it up it's gonna actually you know come in almost like you're wrapping a present or making a bed or like a hospital corner sort of like a hospital corner because we don't when I put the the sew the two edges to the back to the front I don't want to see fabric there um, I don't want to see that edge of that fabric there. I just want to fold it right up. And then I'm going to start lacing back and forth this way. And I'm going to grab that very end. And because we're already fairly tight up here, you don't have to pull it as tight at the top. Now, if you've got those, um, you know, uh, like the, the extra fabric or the, like I said, the pleats or whatever, then you're probably going to have to pull a little bit tighter to, um, and I'm gonna run out of thread here very soon. That's okay, because then I'll show you. Now I'm starting to sniff. Ugh, so I'm going back and forth, top to bottom. All right, so I'm almost out of thread. I'm gonna come down here, pull one more time, and then I'm gonna go through and knot several times. Okay and end this. I would knot several times because you don't want to have to have all those, you don't want your knot to go boink, and then all your, your, your lacings um, open up. So you can kind of see what we're looking like there. All right, and see how pretty it looks on the front. We've got um, just the other half 
of, of this to go. But uh, what I would continue to do is then I would put more thread in the needle, knot it, and then I actually like to start on the opposite side from where I ended, okay? I don't like having two knots so close together because um, that is the point at which the most, you know, the most tension is on that point. So having them together, if this one lets go, I don't want this one to go, hey, he let go, I will too. Um, so I would start my, my knot up here and I would just keep going back and forth and back and forth until I worked over to this end. And you can see, I just kind of, this was hanging down like that. So I just sort of, tucked it up and I held it in place and I would work all the way over to here, knot it, and then you would be done. All right. And okay. Yes. Technically that would be the, your stitching. One thing I will say, and I um, should have mentioned this earlier. Okay. When I started by lacing the long side and I got up here, if this was my stitching before I started doing the curve, very important step, I should have turned it over and made sure that I was still nice and centered and where I wanted to be. Um, and if I wasn't, then just kind of move it and just shuffle the linen around till my image was nice and centered. Because then once I turned and I started lacing up here, doing the basting stitch, that's locking this into place, okay? So if you forget that stitch and you turn it over and you're like, ah, I moved, okay. So you just have to undo a little bit of lacing and go back, it, that's, that's not a big deal. That's also why it's nice to put these safety knots in because if you had done this and you've dis discovered that you were off, you would just have to undo these lacings, but go back to here, scoot yourself around, then get back going on doing your basting. All right, you wouldn't have to start back from square A all over again. So that kind of shows you how you not only get that nice custom curved edge, um, but also how you tackle lacing it. Now, um, I pretty much always lace, well, I, I always lace, um, I always lace my stitching. Um, in this case, I would have had to lace this. It's hard to do any other type of um, finish, whether it be it glue or uh, whatever, um, you know, when you're working with shaped finishes. Now, if I was saying do doing a, a rectangle or a square, I would still, I always lace my, I always lace my needlework. I know to me, it's like hand binding a quilt. It's just what you do. That's how I was taught. That's how, what I like. Um, I, there are many other ways to do that. You do what you're most comfortable with. I like to lace. Um, but now if this was say square, I do on occasion use um, uh, uh, the double-sided acid-free tape. Um, I've done previous tutorials where I kind of showed how to do that um, with a tray bottom. It would be the same thing, just a much smaller scale instead of a tray bottom, an ornament bottom. Um, so once you've got, you'll notice now for edging, I've got my, um, my Rick Rack in there. Once you've got the, the front laced and the back laced, then you're going to sandwich them together. But before you do that, um, I tuck my, my Rick Rack in there. So say if this was the back, I actually, just to give yourself a little helping hand, um, I actually cut little bits of the double-sided acid-free tape and I put them on the inside in here, not too close to the edge, but just in a little bit, just a, just a couple pieces. Because then when I go to cut my Rick Rack, okay, the thing I guess I love about Rick Rack is because it's just so workable. Um, you know, it does corners, I mean, it does curves beautifully. And you just get that nice little pop of color and just something maybe a little unexpected. But I will gently lay my tips down into the double-sided tape and I can kind of guide this around and that way then when I go to put my cover on it my little tips of my rickrack are sticking out I don't have to worry about holding on to everything and then I can um, ladder stitch my front to my back now you'll notice um, corners can be a little bit tricky um, I, ooh, I hate when I see corners. Well, I shouldn't say that. Um, I prefer if you start and stop your Rick Rack at a corner. Start here, lay your Rick Rack in all around, stop here, then lay another piece here. If you try and take your Rick Rack around the corner, it's, 
you end up with kind of a weird fold in the rickrack or it like folds back or it folds front. It just doesn't lay right. Um, so I end up, you know, just, this is actually, if you opened this up, this would be one long piece of rickrack. This would be a separate piece of rickrack. So that's another little tip for, you know, including that as an embellishment. And if you'll notice, I just, um, I just ladder stitched my way, the needle through the front to the back. Now, when I said about having that scant bit of batting, um, kind of showing beyond the edge of either the mat board or the foam core or the cardboard. So what we want to do is when the needle goes through the fabric, it'll also go through the batting. So you're not always hitting the board with the needle. Um, and that, you know, that's definitely helpful and it helps save your fingers a little bit too. But um, Google ladder stitch and um, that'll kind of explain, basically I'm scooping on this side and I'm coming across, I'm scooping on this side, I'm coming across, I'm scooping on this side, you know, and it's just kind of like a back and forth, not a whip stitch where it's just, around, 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 because of the rickrack. That's why we have to do a ladder stitch there. And then, um, oh, I guess I should, should also mention, if you want a, a, um, a, a hanger that's like this, is you'll want to, before you sandwich everything and then put your rickrack in, you'll wanna put a little piece of double-sided tape here, and then I cut my, um, I cut my ribbon to my desired length. I usually like about a three inch drop. So I'll take this and I'll measure, yep, that's about three inches. I'll trim it there. I'll peel back the, um, the double-sided tape and then I'll just lay this down into that. Then put my stitching on top of it and then I start finishing and lacing away. Um, and then afterwards, of course, you know, I, I added my little embellishments of the wool felt ball, the little baker's twine, and all that is really in there with a pin just like that. So that way, um, if, you know, it becomes a little worn or tired or I don't like it anymore, I want to try something else, I can just pick it out and I can put something new on. Um, and then you have just a fun little shaped ornament. It's got a kind of a, I guess I call it more of a, a custom look to it. It just gives it a little character, gives it a little personality. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to bring the camera up. And we're back. Okay, so thank you for spending a little bit of time with me, a little tutorial time and um, learn a little bit more about how to get this custom look, how we start with the rectangle and there's a couple different ways to cut your corners and get a nice um, even professional look um, to your to your nice curved corners and uh, and then also how to tackle lacing them. And if you've never laced before, I really encourage you to try. It's actually very, um, it, it's to me, like I said, it's like hand binding a quilt. Um, it's just, it's very, I don't know, it's almost like zen-like for me, but I just, I kind of do it without even thinking about it. Um, so hopefully, so give that a try sometime. And um, I didn't necessarily go into each and every step too much, but this is a, hopefully enough to get you going. And um, sorry, I didn't get to do a template, but you should have enough of the measurements for this one um, to, to get yourself going. And um, uh, so if you have any questions, you know, please answer and comment or please ask in comments below and I will respond for sure. And of course, if you are looking for the If Pumpkins Could Fly chart, definitely um, contact your shop. I always keep a list on my website of shops that order from me. Uh, check out the blog where I talked about this finish and and thanks to Gary and Ronnie for um, kind of just, you know, kickstarting me to get a little Frankenstein in my life. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so I hope you've enjoyed the video. If there's any part of this that, um, you know, if you're going to use any of this information in your own video or your own class or your own tutorial, you know, just please give a shout out where you got that information. I sure would appreciate that. Um, anyway, uh, uh, you have a lovely day and enjoy the stitch.